So I'll be talking about the dedicated input data sets for the uh, Arctic. So uh, this is a work that's actually been led by Heiner Koenig from SMHI, so I'm presenting on behalf of him. And then um, the integration of the input data set into the system, the system works of CARA has been led by Xiao Ha Yang. And then there's a large amount of people involved in this, so I'm sure I'm missing some names in this uh, list here. So um, classically, data simulation, we already heard this in the presentation, you have uh, the synoptic uh, uh, observations, you have radio suns, we call them temp or balloons, uh, it's maybe a better word than radio suns. Uh, you have ships sailing around in the ocean, you have drifting buoys, tribu. we have aircraft data going uh, across, uh, many airplanes go across uh, Greenland of course, uh, at high altitude though. And we have uh, satellite uh, radiance data, microwave, infrared sounders. Uh, we have scatterometer winds. And we also have uh, radio occultation data. So um, so this is uh, quite a lot. And uh, this is just the uh, domains that we're using. I'll skip past that. Uh, I assume you all saw Hal's introduction that we are running the assimilation, uh, the uh, reanalysis for these domains. Uh, so a main thing that we have done as uh, so all the participating partners here uh, are the national weather services. So we have the national meteorological data sets that we can add into the models. And this is important because in the Arctic area, the data uh, at surface level are extremely sparse. And we actually have a lot of data that haven't been used before. So in Era 5, you can see the blue points here. That's what goes into Era 5, which comes from the DTS system, the sharing system between the National Weather Services. And then the, the red points, that's the National Weather Service and also uh, data from other providers, which I'll show on the next uh, slide. Uh, so as you can see, we have a greatly enhanced amount of input data which is of course important to make a reanalysis because the initial status will be better um, shown. So for Greenland in particular, we have uh, other actors who are giving data. So on the right-hand side is shown the GCNet data that we have, which has been a, a great advantage for us. These have been available since the mid-90s. Uh, so, uh, so this is a great data set. Um, uh, and then... Um, we have the uh, promise data from uh, from Geos, uh, which is uh, also um, so. Both these data sets are on the ice sheet, which none of the um, net, well, only one of the national weathers. We have one on summit, but otherwise we don't have uh, national weather centers, uh, synoptic stations there. Uh, so this is uh, uh, really important. Uh, and then the promise are mostly at the edge of the ice sheet, where you have the glaciers that are. Uh, going going down uh, uh, into the valleys. We also have the ASIAC Greenland Survey uh, meteorological observations shown here in plot number two, uh, which uh, unfortunately that's an agreement between DMI and uh, ASIAC. They, they're not shareable, uh, open source, but um, this is uh, a really important data in this uh, project. Other work we've done with input data is about the physiographic data so in Svalbard, then the ice sheet data have been corrected strongly. So actually, there are some great errors in the ice sheet data. I'll show that on one of the following slides uh, that are very important to correct. Um, uh, and uh, then when you have corrected this, we have filled in with uh, other data. So at the east coast of Greenland, in the, we have filled in with uh, data based on the leaf area index from satellite data. and. Um, Another thing which we only realized when we got into the project is that the coastlines between different data sets in the first geographic data didn't match. And that's what you can see here. So that's actually some huge discrepancies of this uh, northernmost part of the world. Uh, Cap Moyes, yes, you see here. Bartley Parmesan, he did a very great job with uh, fixing this. Uh, we used data from the Danish mapping authorities and many other sources to make sure we got this uh, right. And similar was done by Theresa Valkonen for Svalbard, where some of the glaciers, they have retreated, so you need to change the land sea mask compared to the previous data. Also by Bartley Parmesan, a lot of work was done to input, uh, input the um, gap-filled and corrected Arctic Dem version 7 data. He didn't use the raw Arctic Dem version 7 data he, because there was many flaws in this, so he used a lot of other data sets to really uh, 
go through uh, grid box by grid box uh, and uh, and correct this and make a a reasonable elevation elevation map for Greenland. Um, further, we have uh, used um, glacier albedo. So over all glaciers, we have used uh, satellite albedo data, daily product in uh, 500 meters resolution, uh, at least going back to 2000 when the Modi satellite got up. Uh, in the 90s, we used uh, climatology based on the years 2000 to 2006. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the glacial albedo in era 5, and you can see it's completely homogeneous and very high. So in some places, you can then have that the um, the, the absorbed shortwave can be wrong by, by 300% or more, uh, where you have dark areas in the real world. And also, you see the uh, glacier mask errors here, so there's... Uh, uh, the, the glacier mask is, is way too large, both for Greenland and for Svalbard here, which is um, also a huge uh, issue. So uh, thanks to work helped by Patrick Samuelson from SMHI and again, uh, Bartley Palmerson from the Icelandic Met Office, uh, we also got this into the model in a way so that we're not just forcing these glacial albedo data in, but that the model is relaxing towards these albedo data so that also, when snowfalls occurs in the model, as shown in the upper right-hand corner, uh, so here you have the, the promise, no, no, you have the modis albedo data on the upper left, and then you have a reference model without these data, and then you have the combined data down here. So here you can see that it gets the dark band from uh, the uh, modis um, uh, albedo data uh, nicely, but it also gets this patch of freshly fallen snow, which the model produces. Uh, so that, in a sense, it's um, sort of an assimilation of data, and then it's, it, it means quite a large difference from the reference experiments, which is then uh, quite important. Uh, we are also assimilating snow depth data from uh, Scandinavia, and as you can see here, again, there's many more snow depth data in, in the Copernicus Arctic Reanalysis Project than there is in the Era 5 we're not doing that everywhere because it does need that you have a dense snow depth observation network. If you don't have snow depth observations on mountains, you could actually do damage by assimilating lowland snow depths. So, but we do do it here in um, Scandinavia. Uh, also, assimilated is cryolite, uh, cryoclim uh, satellite snow data at uh, five kilometer resolution. Which uh, So here's one of the test experiments we run when we input these new input data. So you can see you have the reference experiment here shown in light blue. You have uh, observations in black. And then you have this uh, purple cryo B experiment. You can see it's going towards the correct observed temperatures when we input these data. It's not solving all the problems because, of course, when you have discrepancies, they're due to many factors. But you can see it gives improvements there in the melting season, of course, Typically, removing snow when it's melting away is something that's uh, very important to get the surface uh, energy balance uh, right. Uh, we are also using a, a lot of high-resolution uh, sea surface temperature and ice cover data. And um, here we have a product that's been tailor-made for the Arctic. So uh, many people involved, uh, Pia Nielsen Inquist did a lot of nice work, and um, Thomas Levan from Oslo helped. Um, and here we use ESA CCI, uh, HumanSat, uh, OCSAF data, and other data sources, also specific data sources from the Baltic Sea, uh, which is also partly covered by our data set. Uh, to show the difference, uh, you can see on the left-hand side here, you have Euro 5 sea surface temperatures and uh, ice cover. And then in the middle, you can see the, um, the ESA CCI when we put that into the model and interpolate it to the model grid, we get these differences. You can see you have many more structures in the sea surface temperatures here. And also you have some differences in where the ice edge is, which again uh, gives an, uh, an impact in, in changed uh, temperatures. So we had some iterations on this product, but we and eventually we got something we are, we are quite satisfied with. So um, hopefully the users will be as well. Um, Finally, I'll mention upper air satellite data uh, assimilation. So this is something we have done uh, regularly in our weather models, but it's been done quite a lot of improvement, specifically for these Arctic domains. So this is complicated to do over the ice sheet because it goes so high up in the atmosphere. 
uh, and um, also our model stops at 10 hectopascals. We are not assimilating all the channels. We need to select the channels which are important then for our uh, domain. Um, so uh, over time, you can see here this goes from 1997 and until now almost. You then have these um, the microwave satellite data. Uh, the infrared sounders then follow the MEDOP A and MEDOP B. We have the YASI data implemented, which is also um, an improvement that's been made. So it's a great job done on this. Scatterometer data, polar winds. And then we also uh, simulate these uh, radio occultation um, bending angles from the Ramsaf. Um, so that's uh, all I have. So.